Did you get a sheet? Did you get a soul sheet? Okay, it's just thank you, thank you so much. Okay, hello everyone. It's really lovely to see you all, mostly familiar faces from last week. Um, maybe for the benefit of those who weren't here last week, um, I'd like to briefly, briefly summarise what we were doing last week in our introduction and obviously then introduce what we're doing today. Um, if, you, if you want a source sheet, they're over there, thank you. Okay, so last week we began with an introduction to the halachic process and we took the session to explain what are we going to do when we're faced with a halachic question. Uh, we have this topic at hand and we don't know what the halakha has to say about it so in in you know in one sentence we said we go back to the sources and Sorry, we anyone missing a sheet anybody else yeah. okay thank you so much and we see what the sources have to say about the issue but we explained thank you so much. we explained that it's not just um it's not going to be very helpful to merely look in the Torah Shebikhtab itself, to look in the Psukim in the verses to find our answer, because the Torah Shebikhtab goes necessarily hand in hand with the Torah Shebaal Peh, Mishnah, Gemara, the Talmud. And it is full of explanations, expansions, interpretations of the words in the written Torah. And um, we discussed for the rest of the, the Shi'ur, what methodology, what principles are employed in this interpretation of the written law? Uh, we discussed the idea of svara, of logic, common sense, um, the idea of ethics and, and specific verses in the Torah that show that ethics and moral values are always underpinning halakhic decisions. We also discussed some specific examples of mechanisms of principles that are employed in interpreting um, biblical verses in trying to reach a halakhic decision. Um, we ended with a brief, a very, very brief couple of minutes on the philosophy of halakha. Um, if anyone is interested, just because I absolutely love the source, the little extract that we ended with last week, and you weren't here, then I can give that to you, and we can always chat about this lovely extract from Rabbi, Rabbi Cordoza, who is discussing halakha um, as a symphony. He discusses halakha from a musical perspective. Okay, this is just on one foot for the benefit of anyone who missed last week. Now, today we're jumping straight into a specific halachic topic, that, that of artificial meat, which I'll introduce in just a minute. I, I mentioned last week that a lot of this year is going, to be, uh, is going to be done in series, like we'll have a series of a few lectures that um, cover medical halachic topics, or a series of few lectures that cover halachic questions with regard to mourning, avelut, etc. And artificial meat is actually something that we'll spend a couple of um, shiurim on and is going to really stand alone. And I'll explain to you why did I choose this as the first topic? I think that it's one of the most exciting, interesting of, you know, the whole list of topics that we have uh, ahead of us because it's so novel. So artificial meat is not yet on the market. It's just, you know, in, it's still in the research and development stage. And therefore, uh, it's not something that we've had many shiurim on, it's not something we commonly know about, etc. So it's just really quite an, an interesting novel topic to start with. Um, as we said last week, we are going to see how the methodology, which we briefly touched on, is going to be applied to artificial meat as our, as our first case study. And uh, we're going to see during this year different halakhic principles, basic, hal basic halakhic principles discussed. Uh, we'll, we'll explain each one of them and see how they're being applied. Um, but as, as, as soon as I find that there's a point which refers back to our introductory share last week, I wanna point that out to you. And likewise, if as we are studying this particular question, this particular case study, 
you also are reminded of something we did last week, please feel free to share that because I want us as we go along through this course to see how the methodology of halakha, um, you know, has has its consistent application, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, uh, this will all become clearer as we dive into the meat of the topic. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, I'm going to introduce uh, artificial meat. And then I want to throw it out to you and ask you what are the issues at hand, what are the halakhic questions that you think should even be asked, because again, since it is such a novel topic, we we haven't had it thrown around like oh well I've actually been to a shir on this already or yeah I read that when I was in high school I read a whole you know book on this topic this is something so new that the issues at hand are not even clear to all the uh, rabbinic authorities who are trying to grapple with this issue what issues to deal with what questions to ask at that very stage we already have a lot of lack of clarity okay what questions what situations can we compare it to etc cetera, etc cetera. so that i'm going to throw out to you but as a brief introduction artificial meat or lab grown meat synthetic meat cultured meat all all one and the same thing i'll try and be consistent and keep calling it artificial meat um is a process by which they take stem cells from an animal and they culture them in a lab they are replicating them they're multiplying exponentially then they take these strips which have formed transform them on a scaffold and this turns into a 3d tissue which can then be printed and manufactured on a grand scale now this is similar to a lot of tissue engineering which scientists have been working on for years uh, the reason why they take stem cells is because these are cells which are able to a multiply rapidly and b turn into many different types of cells so they take these stem cells and they essentially are uh, attaching them to like a sponge like scaffold where they are flooded with the nutrients to enable them to multiply in the best conditions possible um, and the resultant tissue can be harvested it can be seasoned and it can be cooked is their ultimate aim um, the first artificial burger was served in 2013, which is quite a while ago now, but at the time, nine years ago, it, it had taken two years to reach that stage and it had taken hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we see immediately that the, the whole enterprise of artificial meat still has many challenges uh, facing it. Number one, to reduce the costs and scale up the production. And number two, on a totally different level, the marketing challenge, because they are attempting to bring a new product to the market. This artificial burger is going to be on the shelves or in the freezer section, and they want uh, the consumers to desire this product, to find it a reasonable alternative to normal meat, et cetera, et cetera. And this may not be as simple as it seems. Um, are there any vegetarians in the room? This ish. <laughs> what do you think about artificial meat? Would you eat an artificial burger? Um, I, I would. I would be happy to eat such a thing. Uh, the meat and the plant, what they call the plant-based burgers, which is not the same thing. No, as, no. Um, I think the question I would ask is interestingly comes from the ecology side, and I'm working from our, our daughter, the, the vegan. Okay. And the ecologist, and she says, she would say, it's not just what does it taste like for, for partly it's what did they do to the animals, but partly it's what's going to do to the environment. Okay. Will it help the environment, or is there going to be something horrible about this process, which is going to harm the environment? Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a bunch of those sorts of issues, which aren't the normal halakha issues. No, 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 absolutely. But it's important to understand before we jump into the halakhic side. What is this product? You know, for example, when electricity was a new up and coming thing, the, the POSCIM, the, the ruling authorities made great efforts. Well, many of them did, <laughs> made great efforts to understand how electricity worked. So that if they get a question on a particular electronic appliance on Shabbat, they understand the science, uh, the physics behind it, and they can, they can answer the question with an informed, with an informed background. 
Okay, so I did my market research and asked one vegetarian friend. Also, she also said, I think I would eat this artificial burger. And she said, I think if a vegetarian is a vegetarian for um, like animal rights reasons, then there would be no reason that for them not to, because taking a cell from an animal does not involve any animal cruelty. So this was her presenting the survey that I took of one person. Um, so we can see there are challenges, um, but it's very different, as you mentioned, and it's important to emphasize that, it's very different from any vegetarian substitutes that are on the market at the moment. It is made from a natural animal cell in um, a lab culture, you know, in, in artificial conditions, mimicking the conditions within nature. And unsurprisingly, Israeli companies are well in there in the in the development of of this um, beyond meat, uh, redefining meat. There's many companies who are who are busy busy trying to to uh, progress this product towards the market. And the reason is, as also as you touched on, that there are many uses and many advantages seen in this. First of all, the, the key one that massive global consumption of meat is presenting a real challenge. Uh, because so much land, water, energy is needed um, to keep up with the demand for meat, which is only growing with uh, increasing populations, that, that there's this need to seek many different alternatives. Um, specifically to Israel, which is why they're investing so much of their time in it, it will also mean that it reduces this dependency and this need for Israel to import animals and to import animal feed. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. also the ecology argument. If we reduce our dependency on meat, I just got a question on stage. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, <laughs> it's Hannah. The question for me would be: Is the original stem cell taken from a kosher animal? Great, good question. So in one minute after the introduction, I was about to throw out to all of you what the halachic issues are, and that's already where you're heading, where you're taking us. Okay, amazing question. Um, the final, so we were saying the, the idea of <coughs> if we reduce our dependency on animals, less carbon emissions, etc. And the final case for artificial meat is that <coughs> Um, the all the perceived uh, animal suffering, animal cruelty, etc., um, is is going to hopefully be absolutely brought to zero if there is just a cell taken from an animal and then cultured in a lab. So th this is just a brief introduction to why so many companies are investing their time in doing it, what they are doing in their process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and now it's really time to throw out based on a brief understanding of the scientific process, artificial meat, taking a stem cell, then culturing it in the lab, uh, it multiplies rapidly. And then this tissue is transformed into 3D printed, etc. What halachic questions do you think are relevant to grapple with? Okay. Is it a milk product? Is it pyro? Is it milk? Is it meat? Okay. It can't be milk. But is it, is it kosher in the first place? Okay, okay. So those are two separate questions. As Khana said, is it taken from a kosher animal or is it taken from a non-kosher animal? If it is taken from a non-kosher animal, is it not kosher? Is the product not kosher? And a second question um, is, is this artificial burger meaty or is it actually parav? Um, anything else? Um, if the animal is alive or dead, how it was killed. Okay, absolutely. So you can take it from a kosher animal once, let's start with once it's dead. You can take it from a kosher animal which is dead but hasn't been shechted properly, which is also called a nevela, which is also not something that we would eat. It's not kosher. Mm. Um, you can also try and substitute a dead animal for a live animal and take it from a live animal, what question, what issue could that raise? Ever menachai. A cell started to pull out of the Straight the cheek cell, you're not hurting anyone. We'll see that, we'll see. 
So, so we've got, you know, what, what is its source? And then in looking at what is its source, there's a lot, there's a lot of different options immediately. Okay, the kosher animal, the non-kosher animal, the kosher animal that wasn't shechted properly, the, is it alive or is it dead, as you said. So we're adding on layer upon layer here. Um, anything else? Even if it's from a non-kosher animal, there are, I mean, I don't know if everyone agrees, but there are uh, things that we take from non-kosher animals that have gone through processing that they're not considered an end, like, um, Amazing, machine. amazing. Okay. It's so, not meat that it's kosher, even if it's from an art place. Okay, they, okay. They will kind of tie into the Good, they do tie stuff. into it. Okay, so I want to just, I want to just um, go back. There is an idea, like in the production of gelatin, that you can take something from a non-kosher source. It has been so transformed in a series of different stages that the ultimate product is considered to be kosher. So can we say this about an artificial burger made from the original cell from a non-kosher animal? Now, the question of, is it from a non-kosher source or a kosher source? Is it meat or power? If you're gonna say are intrinsically related because we're gonna apply the same logic. If I'm saying my product is related to my original cell, so I'll come up with the same answer. If my original cell is non-kosher, it's not kosher. If my original cell is kosher, then it's kosher, but it must be meaty by definition. Okay, so there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that, that the logic that we're going to apply to come to one of these conclusions is going to necessarily draw along with it the second conclusion. So they often ask in the halakha, taking into account the impact within the Okay, okay, so thank you for bringing that up. We mentioned last week. Yeah, you, I no, I know, I know. So, but but you, you just know this, intuit this already, that we, that we mentioned that um, um, if the rabbis feel that a biblical command is under danger, they will put a ghetto in place, they will put a boundary in place, an extra restriction in place. However, they will not do so, they will not add on a rabbinic pro prohibition to protect a biblical command if they know that the majority of Am Yisrael cannot uphold such a command. And we saw this inside in the Gemara. Um, and so I think you're basically very much hinting at this principle, which we apply many times, that, well, maybe they're going to say, I have to reach this conclusion or else it's going to at one point become so prevalent in the market and if I rule in such and such way, I'm sort of keeping it very general at the moment. If I rule in such and such way, people will not be able to, to deal with that sub. So, so that, is, that is fair enough. Um, it's also interesting. Okay, no, I'll, I'll leave that to, I will bring it up as it is relevant in the, in the specific example. Anything else? Um, would the lamb that it's created in need to be uh, certified? like the way factories are. <laughs> okay, okay. So when it is given a hefsha at the end, you know, what, what is the, the hefsha sort of including? The whole procedure, basically. Yeah, does the procedure need to be? Really interesting. Well, well, we're all right. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. It's, I don't see so many other options, but it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. At the question stage, it's a really good question. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's irrelevant that we don't have, I, I think, I can't see any other bracha besides for shahakal, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. At the time that you have a new case given to you, you know, you ask everything from every angle. Um, anything else jump to mind? I know when, when the um, non-dairy creamers came out and the, I heard of stock that you had to, at the time, it wasn't prevalent, then they said you need to leave the carton on the table so people see it. So if you're having with meat, they'll know you're not having milk with meat. So that could be a similar thing if it's, if it's considered hard, but it looks like eating hamburger with milk. So, Absolutely. The maritime question. So there, there is an idea, there is a concept in halakha that if something is permissible, but is um, to all intents and purposes, to the, to the external surroundings, is going to look like it's something prohibited, then you should not do that. Or you should avoid the, the confusion by leaving the carton of the 
soy milk on the table, et cetera, et cetera. So definitely a very relevant question. It's going to be something that they're going to grapple with regarding artificial meat, if it's parab. There's, there's another process being researched, which will confuse this completely. Okay. Because as you made the, the comment, if we start from the fact that it was a stem cell from an animal, then we're going to go down this path and we're going to have to. Yeah. They're working on starting from basic protein uh -huh. and developing meat, which once they get to the sort of base stage that you're talking about, they would then scaffold yes. and, and move to the grand scale. But the difference is they haven't started from a sense of okay, that is so interesting. They started from a protein okay. generation. Okay, there you go. It's a bit like a plant based meat. In that sense. Right, but right. We could end up with this confusion like. The Absolutely. Milk. So, what I want you to keep in mind as we're discussing all yeah. the different halakhic subtopics is which one would be equally relevant as a question yeah. on your case study and which one is totally irrelevant? Because each, each little, and that's not a minor difference, that's quite a big difference, but each little difference in a situation will obviously mean that you may derive a different law for that situation. Um, that's really fascinating. What, you know, which of our questions is going to be relevant also for... Right, anything else jump to mind? It's been an amazing <laughs> break, a really you amazing. before they did research as to the marketability of electricity. <laughs> I take a look, I have my phone knowing and I had to send out almost all the rabbis out of the Detroit back uh, information that I could get and to see if they were accepted. Right. And their tools. Right. And it's very interesting. Right. But I think the more information that they are given, the more informed their answer can be. The more informed an authority is, the more they are able to give a full answer and very often a more lenient answer. Um, and I was surprised that uh, the rabbi Lute should not have a clear statement. With, with new so situations, sometimes, sometimes, the, sometimes there isn't yet a clear ruling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also the question of whether or not each rabbin would accept it, for example, in London, they don't accept the Arab in some places. Absolutely. Because the Haredim won't use the Arab. London's so behind the moon, they think it is. No, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that's a more practical issue than a halachic issue, but it is totally related. And it's very relevant because once you have something on the market, and then there's going to be a halakhic ruling in one direction or another, it, it's very, very much going to be relevant whether it's going to be widely accepted or create a division. Yeah, exactly. It's always exactly. going to create a division. <laughs> <laughs> well, we survive every Pesach yeah. with, with kidney art and no kidney art. Smiles on our faces at the end of the week. Um, division that can't be breached. Right, but right. The chance of this there are all different opinions. No, 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 no. There will always be different opinions. Okay, so as we're going to see, there are always different opinions. Again, remember, and especially for the benefit of people who were not here last week, don't be disappointed in advance. I said that my emphasis is never on the bottom line. My emphasis is on showing the process, you know, the process that, that is unraveled to reach the conclusion, especially because the conclusion is really very often, well, there's a disagreement. But I want us to see where each view is coming from, what they're basing their reasoning on. And that is most important to me. Um, okay, so we really have covered almost all of the issues. Okay, there are a couple more, but we will just discuss them as we come on to them. I want to begin with a few subtopics, all of which relate to the same thing, which is the cell itself. So we're going to ask a few halakha questions all about this original cell. For example, we're going to say, um, okay, as has been brought up, is the cell taken from a kosher source or a non-kosher animal? Is the cell taken from a live or a dead animal? But first of all, something even more specific. Is this cell, which is microscopic, 
and not visible to the naked eye, is this cell, even if it's a sore, relevant in the determination of the end product? We have a principle in halakha, nirale enayim, what, what the eye can see, that something that cannot be seen, something that is only microscopic or, or, or visible under a magnifying glass, for example, is not relevant. So, for example, when we are checking our vegetables for bugs, we don't say we have to put the lettuce under a magnifying glass. We say that if you can see something, you would have to remove that. But it may be that there's still, after we've washed it, etc., etc., there may be that there are still microscopic insects on the, on the lettuce, but it is not a sore to eat the lettuce now because something that is not nirale enaim is not relevant for the purposes of halakha. So let's just look at this principle in a little bit more depth and see how it was applied and then see how we can apply it to our case. We have, okay, sorry where there is no English, I apologize. Whenever I can get the English, I do so. Um, we have in source two from the Arach HaShulchan, this principle, um, um, you know, Explained very clearly. He says the Torah will not forbid something that the eye cannot see. Because ultimately the Torah was not given to angels, it was given to humans. This also brings us back to something I was saying last week. The Torah was given to humans. Hashem wants it to be grappled with in the human hands and interpreted by humans. And it also has to respond to the sensitivities and needs of humans. Okay, so he says very explicitly here um, that something that's not visible is not going to be forbidden by the Torah precisely because the Torah was given to humans and not to angels. He's saying, you know, if we wouldn't say this, you're really left in a bit of a quandary because people, there are, there are scientists who say the air is full and full of tiny microscopic insects, etc. As you open your mouth, you, you, you just are swallowing them. <laughs> Sorry if this is putting anyone off. But, but this is not at all dealt with by the Torah. Something on a microscopic level is not relevant in halakha. So that is what the Arach HaShulchan laid out there. Now, um, we brought the example of the lettuce, of bugs on lettuce, bugs on any food. Rav, Shlom Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach also applied it to a question that was raised for Pesach. The water that we drink that is flowing from our taps may, uh, I don't know if it all does, um, originates in the Kinneret, well, the argument went, people throw bread into the Kinneret. People may, you know, whatever, throw remains, crumbs, pieces of bread into the Kinneret. So now we have this body of water which has crumbs floating in it. You may not be able to see them, but there is chametz in the water. So is this a problem on Pesach? And he answers, no. There are several reasons given. I'm, I'm picking on the relevant one for our purposes. He answers, no, something that's microscopic, something that you can't see or sense. Uh, see, you can neither see it nor sense it um, is not a problem at all. There's worse things in the water. So <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping they're filtered out by the time it comes. <laughs> But they, they put filters on their taps because they assumed that there were bugs that were supposed to be shrimp. Yes, like. there is such a, there, yes, there is such a, 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 a practice, yes. My son does that. And so, this is Rav Shomaz Aman Albrach's opinion. And so he says the crumbs are microscopic, there's no problem, they are not us all. But, um, Okay, I brought a short line there. Okay, but interestingly, and I, I'm pleased it's the same person uh, on a totally different case. We have Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach on grafting. So let's see what he says on this process of grafting. Jump to source four. He says, Okay, 
genetic engineering, what are they doing? They're taking sections of cells uh, from one organism to another. But so someone comes up with this grand plan, but let's think about it. If you're going through a grafting process, which is literally just taking some of, of a cell from one type to graft it with another type, sorry, I should have given a, a background. Kilayim, a famous example of kilayim is the mixing of wool and linen, but there are other types of kilayim. It is the mixing of different types, the grafting of different types of things together. There are many examples. Um, so as I said, shutness, wool and linen is, is a Fame is a commonly known example that falls under kilayim. So is, for example, like a nectarine is grafted from a peach and a plum together. That's a sur to do the grafting, but permissible to eat the product of. But there are many, many different types. So he's he's talking here and he's saying, someone suggested <laughs> a nectarine. Is this, is this? No, 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 no. We do find this sometimes. We do find this sometimes. Yeah. So they don't have a grafting anymore. Now it comes off its own tree. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, we do find that sometimes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So so the so the the question was, well, maybe this is totally fine. Maybe this is a way round kilaim. Maybe this is a way round grafting one type with another type, which would otherwise be a sore. Because we're dealing with microscopic parts of a cell from one organism to another. But he says in this case. He says, no, this situation that you're describing to me, that you're asking me about, is a process that is necessarily done under a microscope. And therefore, since the whole procedure is always performed under a microscope, now I'm going to consider that as if it is visible. This is the way to do it. And therefore, it is as if it is visible, and therefore it becomes halakhically relevant again. He's, he ends very clearly by saying, I cannot compare this to the case of the tolaim, of the worms, of the bugs. If a bug is not visible to the naked eye, it is not asur. Um, so now we have to try and apply this. And whenever I ask you this, Try and forget what you want the end answer to be. Try very hard. <laughs> Try very hard to forget what you want the resulting conclusion to be. You know, applying the differences of opinions that we've seen on the principle of Nirela and I'm, if something's microscopic, microscopic or if something's visible, how should we apply this to the cell that we are multiplying? What happens if the cell comes from a non-kosher animal? That would be my question. You can't, see you can't see it, and therefore it should be okay. But the okay. work that is being done is at the microscopic level, therefore the second part adds up. Absolutely. As well, and so you've offered so you've <laughs> offered the two opinions which are offered. You've offered the two opinions which are offered. And um have I brought it this time? I have brought it this time. I won't always bring every, you know, I have brought it this time. Um if we see in source five. Um, Rabbi Tzvi Reisman, he wrote the first article, article in Tchumin on artificial meat. And I'm going to refer to him quite a few times. And then in response to him, in the next Tchumin volume, there were some responding articles because they disagreed. Um, I don't know so much about him. He's a professor, Rabbi, America, America. Sorry, I don't know much more than that. Um, sorry? Oh, well, please share with us. <laughs> it's interesting because I've seen his name quoted without Rabbi in front of it and with Rabbi in front of it. I mean, yeah, 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 which explains, now it explains why. He's not a practicing rabbi, so it's sometimes without. Um, so this article is very comprehensive, covers, I, yeah, it covers all of the issues which we're going to discuss. Um, and as I said, I'll be quoting him a lot. And then it also just, 
started this wonderful dialogue, this wonderful conversation back and forth about the issue in itself, uh, from which we can learn a lot. So in the next Khumin article, well, I haven't read what he said yet. So one second, I'm running ahead of myself. So he says, um, even if we say that this stem cell is contributing taste to this mixture, because it's not visible, it's it, it's just not going to make any resultant product asur. And he says, he refers to the two examples we've discussed in the same way that worms, insects, or chametz, which is in a non-visible uh, state at that moment in time, does not um does not yeah, mean that there's an issue. Stem cells in a cow, for example, are going to be eventually become either meat or they're going to become milk. So therefore, I mean, because they're say, you're talking the same stem cells that become the breast milk of a cow, which is becomes the milk we drink. So you're already in a situation where the stem cells are undifferentiated. It's really interesting. It's a very, very interesting point. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I'm just. Have you ever thought about milk in an udder and whether yes, it is. But at the moment when it's in the udder. Then it's theoretically, it's parallel. That's it. It is parallel. Right? So you could theoretically. So. Whole thing. It, it, <laughs> absolutely, know. absolutely. Rabbinically, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very, very interesting point. So he says. Uh, exactly what you said, this stem cell is not visible and therefore there's no issue. However, Rav Yaakov Ariel, who responded to him in the next volume of Tchumim, who is the chief rabbi of Ramat Gan, and well, all the trivia that I know about him, and he was actually at one point a contender for the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Israel. Um, um, but in, I think he is not as popular in the Haredi circles. He's a very uh, strong Dati Lumi rabbi and leader, and he's also the head of Machon Torah Laaretz, Machon Torah the Haaretz, um, which is just this wonderful institution whose main purpose is is um, discussing, learning, and teaching about um, specifically mitzvot hatluyot Baaretz. For example, Shemitah. This last year, they were very uh, busy. So, Rabbi Yaakov Ariel. Um, responds and he says, This focused, um, um, a, a, a great emphasis and focus that we're placing on this little stem cell and also converting it ultimately to something that can be felt, sensed, seen, touched. It, it gives it its importance. He says, no, think about this. We begin with something invisible, but it turns into something visible. And it, it is our focus. This little cell is the center of our entire procedure. And therefore, it cannot just be written off. It cannot be written off as insignificant in halakha. It is the key to the whole, to the whole product. So... That was, um, uh, uh, you know, al regalachat. I would say that was on one foot discussing artificial meat from the subtopic of nirala inaim, and you can see what we did. We we learnt about this principle. We saw how it's applied in a couple of cases. We saw how this um, authority distinguished between two cases, reaching different conclusions, and how possibly modern day authorities are applying it to our situation at hand. And reaching opposing conclusions, <laughs> um, which is not surprising. You. So, another re related subtopic is that of yotse min hatame, that the derivatives of something tame are going to be considered tame. Or the question is, do we necessarily need to argue that? Do we necessarily need to say that a cell taken from a non kosher animal must be non kosher and the opposite? Um, <laughs> so if we start with it's like kidney oil. Oh okay, okay. Um 
I'm not okay. sure if I would draw an exact parallel. No, there was a source that I wanted to show you. And it, <laughs> no, it's it's not it's not non-comparable. It's not non-comparable. Um, no, Alec, let's let's read it in the source, and then we'll see exactly where this principle is born out. Okay. So no, something got mixed up. Go, jump to source ten. This is a Mishnah in Bechorot. Um, and it says, If a kosher animal gives birth to something that is seemingly a non-kosher animal of sorts, it's permissible to eat. And in the opposite situation, a non-kosher animal gives birth to something which is seemingly tahara, asur ba'achila. It's very asur ba'achila. Theoretical. Very theoretical, yeah. Please don't ask me for example. <laughs> um, absolutely, absolutely, right? Because why? Because whatever comes out of something tameh is tameh. And everything that comes out of something tahar in contrast is tahar. So, it's so interesting that you brought that up. I had such a lovely trip once, uh, a family outing to Dvorat HaTavar. It's, play, it's a bee farm near HaTavar, hence it's called Dvorat HaTavar, it's a cute name. And they were explaining to us regarding honey. Someone asked a question like from a vegan perspective. And then he brought up, it was so lovely, because I, I really, do, I'm really not convinced he had any religious background whatsoever. And I was just so inspired. He suddenly pops up with, well, so that proves to you that it's not a derivative from, it's not from the bee. If it was, a bee is not kosher. So if it was, a, if it was coming from the bee, it wouldn't be kosher and honey is kosher. And he says, this is, this is just a proof for me. Right, and he was arguing against it. He said they can be vegan if they want. His argument wasn't with vegans in general. He said, I think they're wrong because it's not a derivative of animals. Okay, I'm sure they've got an argument back. But what he was saying was, it's not from the bee. The bees convert the pollen, and I'm not sure I'm not saying the exact right words, in the flower into honey. So the bees perform a process, but it's not a derivative from them. So that's why the honey is kosher, because it's not a yotse in hatame at all. The honeys produce it. Um, by the way, though, um, well, let, let's just see it. Okay, so, so let's just say um, the milk from a pig milk is not kosher, because the pig is not kosher. Okay, let's, let's leave it at that. Now, does this mean that the cell from a non-kosher animal, by definition, is not kosher? Is there any way round this Mishnah in, in application to our situation? So if we see, now jumping back to source eight, sorry, they got switched around. Um, this is the Rambam. And the Rambam is discussing different parts of a cow, let's say, different parts of an animal, right? Assuming a kosher animal, okay? We're talking about it from a basar, a basar bachalav perspective, from a meat and milk perspective. And what does he say? Uh, jumping a line, Aval Hamavashel, Shilya, Aar, the Gidin, the Atsamot, the Ikre Karnaim, Utlafaim Harakim, the Chalav, Hatur. Someone who cooks any of these, you can look in the English if you want to see exactly what they are. Someone who cooks any of these non meaty, non flesh parts of the animal, if you cook them in milk, it's fine. So there are sections of an animal that are, so to speak, the non-meaty parts of the animal, which if you cook them in milk, it's fine. And it's fine, you can eat them together. No, no, you're right, you're right. Mid a writer, it's fine. Rabbinically, we don't do it, but... The, the, <laughs> but you're right. But the but let's look at the the principle that he's establishing. That that actually there are parts of the animal which are not considered meaty. So I know we're now talking about basar v'chalav and not tamei or tahar. 
but you can understand that the same logic could be applied. We began with this very, um, it seemed like a, a, a non-movable principle that what comes out of something to me is to me, what comes out of something to her is to her. And actually, when you look into it deeper, it's important to notice that there are parts of an animal which are not considered to be meaty because they are the non-meaty parts of the animal. They are the, the hooves or what's it? The roots of the horns or the soft portions of the hooves, okay? So, so now we, sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. There's a whole discussion. There's a whole discussion about the eggs. Yeah. Excellent. So, so now we have to say, how are we applying it to our artificial burger if the cell was taken from a non kosher animal? Let's say, start with that. Because arguably, you could say a cell taken from a non kosher animal is going to mean that the burger will have to be defined as non kosher. Hayotsemen hatame tame. However, if we've said that there are sections of the cow which can be taken mixed with milk or eaten with milk and you're fine, so does this cell, is it called meaty? Is it a, we, we really have the question now, how are we defining the cell which has been taken? Um, it's a question, you know, arguably the, the synthetic meat that you are taking is more similar to the actual meaty part of a cow than the non-meaty part of a cow. It's taken from the neck muscle of a cow, usually. Um, but it's a question, and obviously it will also depend on exactly what is happening, because different companies may definitely have their own patents, and everyone's doing something slightly different. We discussed before, live animal or dead animal, etc. Um, so we're raising the questions here, okay? This too has different conclusions given in the in the Pesach Halacha, and it also is, remember, these we are analyzing them as mutually exclusive subtopics, but in, in the, the articles written by authorities, they're, they're bringing all the different, either they're saying this one and this one and this one, give me reasons to show you that the ultimate product is not meaty and is not, and is kosher, you know, all they're analyzing each subtopic separately, reaching different conclusions on, of each, and then saying, well, in summary, all of these leads me to conclude that, okay? So this is another question. Now, you brought up the question of panim chadashot. Has this cell, even if it's asor at the beginning, uh, because of yotzeim and hatame, for instance, or <coughs> because of any other reason, I'm, I, I can't say it's microscopic and I'm going to ignore it. Okay, mm -hmm. is this cell which may be asur undergoing so many stages of transformation that the resultant product is a new product and we no longer relate it to the maybe asur original cell? Panim chadashot. Okay, and this idea amazing. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so we'll see it now inside. This is yes, this is the halachic concept that is used in gelatin, as you brought up before, which is uh, many, many authorities discussing this aspect of artificial meat are trying to compare it or contrast it with gelatin. Okay, so now jump to um, source 11, which is in its correct place under the title Panim Khadashat. <laughs> so we see here, again, this lovely theoretical example that's given, okay? Amar of Papa, Hai man de gazal afra mechavera ve avade livinta lo kan. Okay, this one robbed someone else of earth, of dust, then formed it into a brick. He is not considered to have acquired it. Okay, why not? My timer. Dahada mashvele. Sorry, dahada mashvele afra. Well, because he can just convert it back to earth. So you've stolen something. Have you been considered to have acquired it? In this case, no. I took the dust to earth, very theoretical. I, I fashioned it into a brick, but I can now turn it back into the dust, into the earth and return it in its original status. However, the opposite case, Levinta va'avade afra kane. If you took a brick and then you crushed it, um, demolished it into earth, into dust, into mud, you have been considered to have acquired it. Why? 
Amart Dilma Hadar Vavadli Levinta. Why can't you just say, now I will transform it back into its original status? My argument from before. Hi, Levinta Acharita. This is a different brick. Upanim Chadashot Ba'ulakan. When you have taken, in the second scenario, you've taken a brick and you've turned it into earth. If you then ultimately at the end convert it back into a brick, that's a different brick already. And therefore, we have borne out here in this lovely theoretical situation, the idea of panim chadashot. When something has been so transformed, so dramatically changed, it's called a different item. And it no longer has the, the original din, the original halakha of the previous item. So we have here um, the case of gelatin, which is the most a uh, famous practical application of this idea of panim chadashot. Remember, they, the, the authorities received this as a question, as a halakha question, just like we are trying to grapple with artificial meat. What should we do with it? How should we categorize it? Okay. Um, uh, um, gelatin is derived from a protein which is obtained from skin or bones from different animals, sometimes from kosher animals, sometimes from non-kosher animals. And, and they're soaked in hydrochloric acid. It's a whole process over many weeks, even months, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, etc., etc. This original substance that was taken, let's say the bones of a non-kosher animal, has been totally broken down in the process. Now, now I, don't need some. I know. <laughs> I try and keep myself very theoretical when I discuss. <laughs> And it's inevitable, and it's inedible, sorry, and it has now been formed into something totally new. And they received this as a halakha question. We now have products more and more in the market with gelatin as an ingredient. Is this kosher? And is it meaty? Okay, if it's taken from a kosher animal. Um, so some permitted gelatin outright, whether or not its source was kosher or non kosher. Some only permitted gelatin from a kosher animal. Then, for instance, Rav Moshe Feinstein says gelatin is fine from a kosher animal, but he considers gelatin to be pyro. Counting two, you can say what, the one and the other. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I, I was thinking about it, and then I said, no, there's no time to bring all the chuvot on gelatin. And it's definitely, you know, it's a, a matter for another share, as people say. Um, it's very, very interesting to look into, and he's got his reasoning. But then, in contrast, there are people who you may find more logically consistent. There are people who say, you can only have gelatin from a kosher source, and it is meaty. Interestingly, for example, Rav Aaron Kotler said that. Interestingly, his, his sap was ideally, lechat chila, ideally it should be considered meaty. Okay, so the second you say that there's always room for manoeuvre, okay? It, it's, it's, in his eyes, its status should be meaty, but, okay? So, so um, how does this, how does this, situ how does this uh, case study of gelatin apply to our situation? So, anyone have any opinions as to no, what they think? On the gelatin. If it's a fish gelatin, how can you use it in meat? Because you of? You cook fish and meat. Yeah, together. yeah, okay. So, now we're already <laughs> on a lower level of a, of a prohibition. Um, it's very possible, I don't know this as a fact, because the fish gelatin is usually preferred. Um, it's very possible there is an opinion out there who says the gelatin is considered still to be fishy and therefore don't cook it with me but i i believe the general general view of gelatin is panim chadashot is that this is very much a, a, a case study in which we can apply the idea of something undergoes so much transformation it's no longer the original um item so how does someone want to argue how we can apply this to our artificial burger? Okay. They're taking the cell and multiplying it. I mean, I don't really understand the process of it, but it's not getting treated in acids and you know, becoming these different things along the way. So. Okay. It's depending really what the process is on its face, it doesn't sound. Okay, so the people who are stringent, at least based on this subtopic, this halakhic question, will say exactly that. They'll say 
that it is undergoing a whole transformation, but the idea is to multiply this very cell, it's to replicate this original cell, which is different, as you said, from gelatin, which I think is a very fair contrast between the two cases. We have many opinions, though, who say based on this, source 12, for, for example, this is Rav Aviner, he says, this meat undergoes many changes to the point that its entire identity is different. This is the same as gelatin from non-kosher animals. The bones undergo so many changes that the product is considered an entirely new creation. So he relates the two and as if draws a direct comparison between them. And he says, in the same way that many people allow gelatin, even from non-kosher sources, I would allow a cell to be taken from a non-kosher animal and used in the production of an artificial burger. Um, similarly, Rav Dov Lior says, something that's been so changed has lost its original status. This is exactly the type of thing that we can call panim chadashot, zelo besari, and it's not meaty. So this is uh, going back to your question of, well, if I conclude that it's kosher, even though it's from a non-kosher animal, am I not also going to conclude? So this exactly is um, seen in this statement. He's saying it's panim chadashot, so whether or not it was from a non-kosher animal, it's kosher, and even if it's and let's say it's from a kosher animal, it's not considered to be meaty for the same reason. So Panim Chadashot is explaining the two together. Um, but um, i sorry that I didn't bring it on the source sheet. There are, as you suggested, many people who do rule in the other direction and say, no, you can't draw a direct comparison at all. Um, and also they're saying, listen, there was a whole debate about gelatin. There's many who only allow it to be from a kosher source. So straight away, that's going to limit you. At the very best, you will only support, you know, you'll only allow kosher, um, artificial meat to be made from a kosher source. Um, so again, with the, with the idea of panim chadashot that we just very quickly touched on and analyzed it as a halakhic principle, when applying it, there are people who will interpret it in one direction and totally the other direction. Um, I'm going to stop here for today. We have essentially touched on different issues that relate to the cell itself. We'll be carrying on with that next week, but also just touching on many other issues. So I just want to sort of put that in its context. The issues we discussed today were very different halakhic questions, but they were all really focusing on that original cell itself. But as many of you brought up, there's also other questions just like maratayin. Is it confusing people? Does it seem to be um, forbidden? And that has nothing to do with the cell itself. So um, we're just going to see how from so many different angles, artificial meat can be analysed with halakhic principles. Um, and I hope to see you all next week. Thank you. <laughs>